Yes, everyone, you know what time it is. It's your boys, Jack and Dave here, joined again by Sonny, and there is a reason for that. This is the 38th episode of this podcast. We've been trudging along. We've been trying our best to put them out there as much as we can, and we felt like we needed some help. We felt like we needed some extra contribution. We needed some extra voices. Dave and I start to, you know, need, you know, need some extra voices to you know, collaborate with, you know, get some more Spurs opinions in here. And uh, we've seen that Sonny from Sunny Talk Spurs is definitely somebody that we enjoy having these combos with, really enjoyed the podcast with, and we're looking forward to many more with him. So everybody at the Irish Hotspur, feel free to welcome in Sonny to this podcast. We're going to be doing plenty of these from here on out. And also go on and check out his channel as well, of course, see all the videos that he's going to be pumping out there for the rest of this season. But Sonny, how are you keeping? And, uh, you know, busy day. I think you just told me right today with the bar and everything. Yeah. So basically, yeah, really busy day at TalkSport with all the VAR and the audio. Basically, people having to chop it up really quickly to get out on air, react to it, get the callers in. Some really salty Liverpool fans, obviously. But yeah, keeping really well. Cheers for your kind words. Cheers for the plug. Looking forward to doing these going forward. But I have got one thing I want to say. I've just bought my first bottle of Prime, and I'm not sure if I like it. And it is Arsenal, isn't it? Really? So maybe I shouldn't have, maybe I shouldn't have uh, declared that. But it's a weird taste. I'm, I'm not too sure. Do you know what, Tony? I had a bottle there uh, about a month ago, and I was not impressed with it whatsoever. And for the price mm. it's gone, it's absolutely horrendous. It tastes. Mm. It's really weird. KSI, it's just... Paul Brothers do better. It's just. Do you know what it is? It's because I think it's coconut water. I'm not a big fan of coconut because it's got that weird aftertaste. So I was like, mm. 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 and then I thought it was growing at me. Then nah, not for me. Not for me. Don't waste your money, people out there. It's not worth <laughs> it. was a busy day for you as well, Dave, behind the scenes. Maybe not as much with VAR, you know, interrupting everything, but you also had a busy day. Did you need any energy drinks to get you through it? Um, no, no energy drinks today. I'm trying to be good lately, Jack, trying to stay on the water and more juice drinks than fizzy and stuff like that, you know, trying to get my figure in shape for Christmas so I can get it back out of shape again. Oh, nice to hear that. Everybody, please follow along with Dave. Motivating words to hear from him. If you haven't already, though, please, everybody, do smash that like button. Do get your comments in below. What you want to see us talk about maybe for next time with Sonny and also maybe any guests you want to see us, you know, kind of collaborate with in the near future. But let's get started straight away with sort of Spurs and how we broke the VAR universe, it feels like. And the recordings have been released today, Sonny. It feels like we're going to be feeling the heat and the hate of the rest of the Premier League for some time now. Just a huge blunder, I'll be honest, from uh, from the VAR officials. What do you make of all of it? And what do you make of also the response by Liverpool fans as well? You know, Spurs fans have been taking a real crack out of that. So, you know, just this whole situation. What did you make I mean, of it? I mean, where where do I begin? Honestly, I it, 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 it couldn't have happened to any other club than us, could it? You know, that we're involved in probably one of the biggest errors in Premier League history, in the VAR era at least. But... Yeah, just, I mean, obviously, I can't sit here and say, you know, it obviously was onside. Romero's leg is clearly dangling out. It's been proven and all that. The audio is, it just paints the PGMOL, Howard Webb, VAR, Premier League in such a bad, bad light. And I know if we were on the other side of it, we would all be absolutely seething. But we have been on the other side of loads of decisions like this. So that's where I feel like Tottenham and the vibe after that game was not so much well like well done Tottenham you've you know overcome this Arsenal and Liverpool game it was pretty much well you couldn't beat a, t- a team with nine men oh if it was 11 v 11 it should have been different oh we should be replays oh it, that's not going to happen like there's not going to be a replay there's not going to be points given the PGMOL are just going to admit that they got it wrong and they're going to try and learn from their mistakes and that's what's going to happen but I just I, I can't understand I don't get me wrong obviously I'm one of them as well some of us Tottenham fans have been driving uh like jibing and with Liverpool fans but football is tribal we are going to do that it is just the way the world works um sadly and happily whatever you want to think about that but yeah I just think you know the the amount of mistakes Mm. we've been on the end of especially in this fixture as well you know we did a video on my channel didn't we about breaking the Liverpool curse I think we've broken it so much that we've actually cast the spell on them and given them the curse in return so yeah just a bonkers day and you know fair enough for actually them releasing the audio as early as they have you know only what we now Tuesday when we're recording this and it obviously happened on Saturday evening so fair play for 
owning up to it. But as I said, does not paint them in a good light, especially with all the effing and jeffing they're doing on the mic. Well, when it happens to the Premier League's darlings, you know, it's going to come out as quickly as it possibly can. The apology came out, you know, so quickly. And look at the recordings with the video as well, you know, there to overlay it. It's perfectly edited for us to all yeah, see where it all went wrong. I'm not surprised that it's uh, been coming out this quickly. But Dave, it's been regarded by Liverpool fans as the worst ever refereeing display in Premier League history. Mm -hmm. Definitely maybe one of the biggest VAR mistakes in Premier League history, but worst refereeing display. I mean, yeah, that's only because Liverpool are involved. What about the Champions League final? We were five minutes in, it was spoiled with the Sissoko decision. What about Jota's head kick to skip last year? Then goes on to score the winner. Uh, the build-up of one of Mo Salah's goal where he handballed, and they still gave it, even though they weren't giving it to any other team in the Premier League. So, I mean, look, they can cry all they want, Jack. Um, but at the end of the day, referees are human beings. They're going to make mistakes. In an ideal world, do we want it to be perfect? Yes, of course we do. But, unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. And look, you know my, my, my feelings of VAR. I think football is too, especially Premier League football, I think it's too vast. I mean, uh, it, it's too fast of a pace of a game to be able to implement VAR without sort of disrupting it. And I just don't think, you know, I think until the officials learn how to use it, learn how to communicate it, and it's a bulletproof system, for me, get it out of the game because I think it's ruining football. I think all the talking points are about VAR instead of the football. But look, Jack, I mean... The backlash that's come off it. Somehow, you know, everyone hates Tottenham. You're seeing Man United and Liverpool fans smooching. You know, the Premier League's coming together. They're all anti-Tottenham now. And to be honest with you, I love it, Jack. I wear it as a badge of honour. I thrive off it. And also, it's a sign that we're doing uh, we're doing swim swimmingly well. So, you know, I, I absolutely thrive off it. But, you know, who knew it would take one VR decision and Tottenham to go on an unbeaten run seven games into the season? For the whole Premier League to go into meltdown, um, you know they want to change yeah. rules, they want to replay games, they want to cancel football, they want to investigate corruption, you know. But look, it, I absolutely thrive off. I encourage every other Spurs fan out there to thrive off off the backlash we're getting. And to those Liverpool fans, I've made up a song for you. I'm loving VAR instead. <laughs> I threw it all. We get the decisions we want to. Under big and past the car glue, whether they're right or wrong. <laughs> and the waterfall really good. is where we collect your tears after years and years of being on the wrong end. Because everywhere we go, <laughs> I'm loving VAR instead. E -E -E. That's what wow. I say. Uh, I'm looking forward to what, uh, what is it? The, it's the Grammys. Yes, Dave, you're going to be nominated for best Spurs, <laughs> best Spurs mock-up song. You'll be alongside James Black. You'll be competing with all the rest of them. I'm loving it right here, Dave. And I must say where it's kind of more entertaining too, is the fact that it feels like it, these sort of decisions, I think do end up kind of happening where it's, they do get it wrong. Like the referees and VAR does seem to get it wrong in the past, but now that it's happened in this sort of manner, in this sort of big game, Spurs have seemingly sort of just kind of woken people up to sort of, I think the fact that maybe VAR hasn't really improved for what, three to four years, I would say. Like we're now three to four years down the road and we're still kind of seeing these big blunders sort of happening. I feel like these sort of offside kind of ones have actually happened in the past, but maybe this didn't happen in as high profile of games for us to really have all of this sort of kind of footage kind of, you know, um, you know, leaking out and the sort of demand for the footage to be leaking out. Another thing, too, in sort of the actual video and the recording itself, they clearly have this. I don't know if boys club is a harsh word. I apologize to them, but it does feels like there's this sort of protocol with how they speak to each other, when they can speak to each other, what they're supposed to be saying, how they're supposed to be saying it when they can actually cut across with the referee and everything like that. Because if the decision was blatantly wrong and they knew it was blatantly wrong, you would just sort of, I mean, cut against all protocol and you would just let them know that, sorry, we made a mistake. You made a mistake. It's all kind of messed up. Let's clear things up. Let's clear the air. This was a goal. And maybe, yeah, you would still get criticized for how it all went down. People are like, geez, they don't know what they're doing, but at least the right decision would have been made probably less whining, less complaining from Liverpool fans. And probably this wouldn't end up being such a huge blunder for weeks and weeks and weeks on end that people are going to reference and remember for a long time. It actually would have been probably forgotten 
had they just decided to just break the protocol and just decide to just give it a goal. But instead they didn't. And also the way that they feel uncomfortable about seemingly cutting across the referee. We saw that in the past with the Cucurea incident, you know, with uh, with Romero. So there is this, I think, kind of boys club type of mentality amongst them where they kind of don't want to make each other look bad. They don't want to make VAR look bad. They don't want to make the referee look bad. And then it ends up sort of just costing the actual game itself. And I'm a little worried that we're not going to really see much improvement again because it feels like, I don't know, three to four years down the road, are, I don't know, the same conversations, sort of the same levels of blunders and the same levels of mistakes. And it's all just kind of a bit cyclical or maybe not actually cyclical. Maybe it's actually just standstill. It's just, been, you know, we're in the same position from where it started. But I don't know. I, that's where I sort of leave it on bar. And also as well, I think there needs to be more of a shakeup in terms of the actual referees themselves maybe they need to be outsourced to other leagues where we can actually poach some of the referees like that really good guy out of poland i thought was one of the best referees you know that i'd seen a long time i know there's very good referees in turkey as well that we see often used in the champions league that sort of thing i think could be looked into as well they also i think need to look into more of the grassroots sort of kind of recruitment like dermot gallagher i think brought up on talk sport i think he mentioned that they're kind of you know trying to improve more of the grassroots sort of recruitment of referee, but I mean, it's not going to really happen overnight. So we need to find a way to, uh, you know, get it kind of, I guess, happening as quickly as we can. But I don't know. That's sort of all I have to say, really, on VAR, at least it, uh, apart from even mentioning Liverpool and their complaining. That's all I have to say on VAR. Yeah, look, what, what I would add to that, I think, I think there needs to be a lot more money invested into the actual referees themselves. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I, because what they've done is the, the, the refereeing standards were dropping. And instead of, you know, investing into referees themselves, like you said, Jack, grassroots being able to bring up young referees, etc., and maybe cutting a lot of the red tape before you get to the Premier League level, because you have to do so many years at so many stages and stuff like that. They put the money into the technology, but yet no one knows how to use it or implement it properly or anything like that. And for me, I think... Not all technology is bad. You look at the goal line system, I think that works. The offside system they used in the World Cup, I think that works. But for the rest of the game, you're talking about a, a high-speed game that when they slow everything down to slow motion, everything looks worse than what it is. And that's why I think VAR will never, ever really work in the Premier League. The reason why it works in rugby and cricket it's because it's a different game. It's slower. You you can use VAR while the ball's in play, this, that, and the other. Whereas with football, 30 seconds is a very long time. It can be the difference between the ball up the other end and in the back of the net. And then you can't mm -hmm. really go back on other on things, on decisions. And then all of a sudden, you know, that, that's been highlighted. Well, this goal shouldn't have stood because of this tackle here, this, that, and the other. And it's creating a lot more controversy around all the decision making. I also think a lot of the rules need to be cleared up. There's so many stigmatizations and permutations that they have to take into account when they're making a decision. In fairness to the referees, it's probably actually nearly impossible to come to the right decision. So I think, you know, the whole area, the whole aspect needs to be cleaned up with the amount of mm. money in football. You need to start investing it into this side of the game if you want it to match where the standard of the Premier League is. It's that simple. Also, I'd like to add as well, like of what you said there, Dave, like it's being compared with other sports. I think, first of all, you're right about it being slower. There's also more pauses in cricket and mm -hmm. rugby. Like the timer stops. Cricket, you can literally stop between uh, uh, different like um, innings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And also, um, the thing is, a lot of these sports is pretty much black and white. You're out or you're not out. It's hit the bat. It's not hit the bat. Whereas football is still up for a lot of, you know... It's hit you his could, hand, but what does that mean if it yeah, actually yeah. hits his hand, That's right? You, 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 could show, you could show 100 football fans the still of Basuma and uh, the Curtis Jones tackle, and each person would probably say, like, oh, I'm not mm. sure, oh, but all that, oh, but he has studs up, but he is going for it, yeah. he's lunging for the ball. Like, you'll never get one... You never get two football fans agree on anything, even if they're yeah. from the same team. There's too much, but you'd hope... Offside is offside. You're either, but then even that, it's like, is it the foot? Is it the toe? Is it the sleeve? Is it the, are they leaning? Like, is it benefit of the doubt of the attacker or the defense? Same with handball. The handball rules just stupid. Like, we record this during the Champions League game. It's different from UEFA to it is with the FA. Like, there's too much. Di and also, I think what I want to clarify as well is from Monday Night Football, Jamie Carragher revealed that basically when they're sending them over to the monitor, it is 
them telling the referee you've made a wrong decision, but it's called video assistant referee. Like it's meant to assist. It's meant to go. We think that they might, this might be an issue. And then he goes over and then he makes his decision after that. It's always guaranteed that if you go to the screen, it's going to change. So are they showing him, by the way, we've made the decision, but this is what we've seen and we're showing you our working out. Or are they going to show him it and go, we've got evidence to suggest this could be a red card or a handball. Mm. Now make a new decision off the back of it. And also like all this stuff about, oh, it looks worse slow-mo. It looks like, I, I feel like that's taken out of context too much. Like a tackle can look bad at higher speed or slow-mo. You have to slow it down to actually see what it was. Because for example, the referee didn't see it in normal speed when he was watching it there. So you're slowing it down to make it easier. You're showing him a different camera angle to what he was standing at. So I don't, I don't really get the argument around all this slowing it down and stuff like that. It's actually, as I say, it's a video assistant referee. It's meant to do all of those things. And, you know, we've seen tonight, the Curtis Jones red card has been given. It's a bad tackle. The G- the Jota two yellows were bad challenges. Like, a doggy, yeah, he's hit his foot, but he's got clipped as well. Like, I, I don't get where, like, people, as I said, people are always going to disagree. And, you know, maybe if it was us, like Jota was playing for us, we'd have a go. But that is just the way of the beast. Like, we're, we're very biased towards our teams. But with offside, you just, it is literally black or white and they should just bring the automated ones that they have in the Champions League to the Premier League and I think they will. Mm. It's a bad case though when you're apologizing to a team practically every weekend and I think Mm. that's where it's reaching with the PGMOL and just in VAR in general. What I didn't like about Liverpool fans was sort of the feeling like this hasn't happened to any other team even this season Mm. or in general over the past few seasons. It's like let's be honest like there's already been plenty of apologies already for atrocious decisions that probably should have led to different point outcomes should have led to a different game result like in the case of Wolves in the very beginning of the season like in the case I think just recently the Luton Town right penalty that ended up you know costing Wolves again you know other points that was a very debatable Forest as well with the key for Matt Turner very Mm. debatable decisions that ultimately I think in some cases they even came out and just said we're just yeah we got that one wrong it's not really in line with how we usually give the decisions so I can respect that Liverpool had a really bad day with the referees, but as has every other team in the Premier League at some stage. It's not even biased anymore towards one or the other. Each team is getting a real bad case or it gets a real bad deal from the referees every now and again. And it's like we can either get rid of that and just not deal with it anymore. Or it's just going to one day your number is going to get called and the VAR is going to screw you over with the decision, it feels mm. like. But let's not well, pretend like it happens to one team more than another, especially in the case of Liverpool. They benefited a lot last season anyway. Like, I think they released some they like a title before. Yeah. yeah. But that, that's what annoys me as well. They released like this, like, thing this season of VAR, things that have benefited, teams that have benefited from VAR this season. And it had us top with like 19 points or nine, whatever. But it's like, that's misleading because that doesn't suggest whether the VAR decisions were right or wrong because mm. it could have been a right decision of offside or a penalty or it could have been the case of the weekend just gone. I just feel like this whole discussion, like it's, it's what Dave was saying earlier, we're, we're spending too much time talking about VAR when we should be talking about the beautiful game itself. It's really, you know, I remember them saying on Match of the Day back, in, uh, back when they introduced VAR, we're hopefully going to talk less about refereeing howlers we're now mm. talking about them even more because yeah. it's now like under a microscope and being amplified into the nth degree. And it's just, it's getting silly. But it's, I was just thinking when you were saying there, Jack, like this is giving me vibes of Sheffield United, Aston Villa, you know, where the ball clearly went over the line. But that was because the technology failed. Whereas this is human error. They've admitted that. Mm. Like it, they did draw the lines that it said it. So that's why they're yeah. getting more criticised this time around. Yeah. And, but, and then that ultimately costs Sheffield United relegation. But again, I'm going to reiterate, the game will not be replayed. Points will not be given out to Liverpool. It's just one of those things. And you know that's what's going to happen because we're Spurs. We'll probably get something this season as well. And then we'll not know what to say or do. Well, we already have. I mean, you know, the Sheffield United tackle on James Madison inside the penalty area. Not mm. given. You know, um, Martinez on Romero against Man United, shoulder barged them. Not given. Mm. I mean, you know, there's plenty of decisions that Brentford. haven't gone our way. But... Was soft. 
it, it, exactly, you know. And, and and the thing is, like, what what's driving me mad about this whole thing is, well, I'm actually pleased that everyone's more talking about VAR and not talking about Tottenham. But my problem with Liverpool fans <laughs> is just the sheer disrespect they're showing to Tottenham. Mm. You know, it's oh, you only won that because of VAR. You know, feel sorry for us. Praise our nine men. Clap them off the pitch. No. You didn't feel sorry for us when the handball uh, for Suzuki in the Champions League final. Mm. You found every reason and every screenshot and every rule possible to, to legitimise it. You know, last season, mm. the judge kicked to Skip's head. They done the exact same thing. Every excuse, every rule, every and screenshot. Said as well, didn't he? Not, not to worry about. Not to worry about. Oh, he's worrying well, now, isn't he? About. Exactly. And what they won't talk about after this game. Is the Curtis John tackle. The reason why he lunged in like that with studs up is because he was getting um, tackled harder than what he's ever done before against Tottenham. He was in a battle. He couldn't handle it and he lashed out. That's on him. That's a mentality problem on the player. You look at Diego Joss, same thing, getting harassed and Harry. Things weren't going his way like they usually do. He couldn't handle it. He lashed out. That's a mentality uh, and a petulance problem, an attitude problem. That's nothing to do with VAR. So what we what they should really be doing is thanking Tottenham for exposing their weakness. You know, something that they yeah. actually need to go back onto well, the training one. ground and work on, which is their attitude. You know, we actually forced them into descending us, and we don't get enough credit for that. But they're acting like the referee is the reason why they lost. It's not. Tottenham are better than what they thought we were. And they realised that, just like every other team that have been running their mouth before the game, thinking yeah. Tottenham it's three points, we roll in with our high intensity all out attack and football. They can't handle it. We roll through them, roll out the other end with three points, wave at them on the way out, and they're left sitting there going, "What the fuck have we just come up against?" And they can't, they can't work out a way to stop it. So what they should really be doing is praising us instead of using the referee as an excuse why they didn't win that game. Look at Jurgen Klopp. Look at the tactics. Look at the team selection. And look at the look, look at the um, look at the um, petulance of the players, the arrogance of the players that they think they can lash. But you know what? That's another thing. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, you know what? That's another thing, right? They've been on so many right sides of the referee decisions that they weren't they weren't expecting the referee to actually hold them to the letter of law this time. Another funny thing, though, is that we've hilariously gone from now every YouTuber out there on the football side, you know, po you know, posting, oh, the revolution under Pasta Coglu, look how you know Spurs have changed and this new dreamland that we're in. And now all of a sudden we're VAR's best friend and uh, Spurs aren't going to be able to get into the top four without VAR, you know, sort of kind of uh, conversations. It's quite fun to see that sort of flip. And in a way it's good because we now get to sort of hide underneath, you know, the, the shadows of VAR and no one actually gets <laughs> to talk about, you know, how good we are. We get to be one of those secret weapons again. Sonny, unless you have any other extra points, we do have a certain man that deserves some praise today. And I know you put out a video on him recently, but did you have any uh, any other sort of kind of uh, points on VAR or sort of the Liverpool game in general? I think I've got to leave it there, otherwise I'll lose my head and go on another rant. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. Um, Paratici, you posted a video this week basically mm. saying that he might be more of the secret behind Spurs' recent success. I'd like you to go first on it. And it's something that Dave and I, by the way, have absolutely subscribed to and have been subscribing to very for a very long time, even nicknamed the Parachuti twi uh, Twins at one stage for our love and uh, attention and propaganda nearly for the guy. <laughs> That's how much we loved him. But we'll let you go first. What kind of made you want to make that video and start thinking about that? Well, I'll be honest, it was thanks to my dad, to be fair, because he sort of sent me a message. And I feel like he's become my like creative director since I've, <laughs> since I've done the YouTube sort of stuff, because he was like telling me a few ideas the other week. And he was like, what, did, what about talking about uh, Paratici and sort of say like, you know, his signings are actually, you know, because I feel like there was a big thing, obviously, with under Conte and Nuno, obviously, as well. He was sort of there and we weren't really sure what he was all about. And he's just plucking players out of Italy because he's got a black book and he can contact them easy. And then, obviously, all the controversy around Juventus gets him in a bit of a storm. And he then, obviously, gets banned. But then, I'm, I mean... I'm not really 100% sure about it, whether he's still working with the club closely yeah. or whether oh, he is. So I, I made sure I wasn't I wasn't 100% when I said it in the video. <laughs> I was like, I think he is, but I don't want to get in trouble. So um, obviously yeah, he's still in this, secret. Yeah, <laughs> obviously he's still in this advisory role, which is quite interesting. But I just wanted to highlight, like, 
it, his scouting and his contacts of the players that he's put now in this starting team are fantastic. And like the deals he was doing with like these loans with obligations and options to buy and getting, you know, the good fee for Kulisevsky. I just think it's just amazing. And if any other team was doing this sort of like business, I think they'd be applauding more. And we've got to sort of sit back and sometimes not just go, you know, we applaud Ange for the start he's done and we love him to bits already. We give Levy a bit of stick and then we, you know, appraise him for sorting the Madison deal basically out because he seems to deal more yeah. with the English clubs than, um, say, uh, yeah, yeah. say, say Paratici was. But I think what happened was because we were obviously managed by Conte and then we didn't know whether these signs were his or they were club signings and then Basuma didn't hit the ground running. There was sort of a bit of a mist about like where these players sort of fit and who where they their futures lie. So I feel like it, I just wanted in this video to go through like all the players, even the players who one maybe haven't hit the ground running, such as Richarlison, still got promise and time to convince us. And even like some of the other players, like you know Saar, like what a gem he was and that under the Paratici reign. And even like Fraser Forster, good backup keeper. I feel like you know it, it, he did so well in the this window. And we even said last summer how good the window was, but we didn't get to fully see these players because of Conte. And mm. now under Rams, they're really flourishing. And I just think I wanted to highlight because a lot of Spurs fans have been saying it, especially my dad highlighted on the forums on Facebook is where he spends most of his time getting his Tottenham Hotspur, Tottenham Hotspur info. So I just wanted to really highlight. So yeah. I feel like I basically reiterated the whole video out there. But if you want to go and watch it and hear me say it all again, then you know where to check it out. Ange is the one who's cooking, Dave, but maybe Paratici was the one originally cooking and he did give Ange the ingredients. Yeah, look, I think, you know, come the end of this season, I'm predicting we're going to have a good season. I think, you know, there'll be a lot of hindsight. And, you know, I think even the likes of Sky Sports and a lot of them other companies to start looking at how Tottenham have built this. Now, look, one thing we have to understand is that Steve Hitchin got us into an absolute mess, overpaying for average players who just simply weren't good enough. And when we tried to ship them on because they were so bad, and when you could put bad players on top of bad players, they make them even worse. We had no resale value, and we're still feeling the hit of that today, currently as we speak, and we're going to have it again next summer as well. Um, but with Paratici, he came in, and he was signing a lot of younger players. And at the time, a lot of people didn't understand it. You know, they're like, we need players for the here and now. We need players ready to go. But because we don't operate the way, for instance, Todd Bowley does at Chelsea, the way we offload players makes Paratici's job even harder, but also means that it takes longer for the results of, of or the fruits of his labour, a.k.a. the results of your recruitment, to sort of shine true. But one thing Paratici brought when he came to this football club, because Daniel Levy was a long-term admirer, and I'm of the opinion he saved Daniel Levy, in my opinion, because he brought a structure, he brought a plan, he, he brought a vision, and he brought the know-how to implement it as well. So my, Because at that time, I think Daniel Levy was lost. The first team was in a mess. The, the recruitment was a mess. The academy was a mess. You know, he put all his yeah. focus and all the infrastructure that he took his eye off all the internal parts. And Paratici came here quickly done a whole review of the club and went about putting all that in place. But because of how long it takes us to get rid of players and the way we operate in terms of a business model, wage structure, et cetera, et cetera, it was always going to take longer because it's always going to be small increments. But now all mm -hmm. them small increments are put in together to form one team. Look at the difference. But I think the biggest for me is look at the prices that we've paid for a lot of these players. Yeah. Um, they're all affordable, um, which is what, we, you know, and and, and they, they don't go against Tottenham Hotspur model. You know, they suit Daniel Levy. Um, but also, you know, he brought the, the youth eccentric sort of model. He lowered the average age of the first team while upping the quality of player right across nearly every single position in that team. Um so I mean, uh, wh while also combining it with a with a, with a future vision for going and recruiting some of the some some younger homegrown players and stuff like that, putting them into the academy so that then we have our homegrown quota coming through, um, in in a market where that that price is only rising. So for me, I think he's done an absolute magnificent job. All the directive has come from him, and the fact that he's got his ban 
after everything that went on in Juve and the club still want to keep him on his advisor role, shows me that they're still working off his plan, his vision and everything else. Literally, he can see, he can, he can still direct Tottenham what to go and do. He just can't actually negotiate the deals. That's the only difference. But for me, I think he's done an absolute incredible job. A lot of people, they would also aim the manager's sort of choices at him, Jack. But I'm of the opinion, I've said this a long time before, Daniel Levy knew how crap this squad was. That's why he hired in well, three defensive managers underneath Pochettino, um, you know, to cover even, up that because he didn't want to spend the multi-millions of pounds that it'd take to fix it. Quickly, though, on that sort of manager kind of point, though, at the end, and then I kind of wanted to make my own, but Daniel Levy sort of subtly admitted to that was his own tactic was to go for the more defensive when now type of managers like and everything. So in a way, like, can we really fully say, like Paracici, of course, played a very big part in picking Nuno, played a very big part in picking Conte. But can we say that maybe part of it was kind of filtered through Daniel Levy, kind of still clinging on to the notion that maybe these win now defensive sort of managers are actually the right way to go? And felt like maybe that's what sort of the, the thought process was, because even in that recent sort of fans forum, he just sort of admitted to that. And Paratici, I'm not saying would have brought in like Pasta Pagel or would have brought in a super progressive on the front foot manager. I'm just saying, though, at the time, that was still the thinking at Spurs. So you can't just completely, I think, throw him under the bus for those managerial decisions in the space of two seasons, though, space of two seasons, like two summers, two January windows where he was like the full-time director of football before even the bands or anything like that, or even like the consultancy role. I think this guy has basically taken down the foundation of Spurs that was rotten and then built an entirely new one that's actually going to last us for a very, very long time. He's managed to get rid of over 18 players in the time that he's been here in that two seasons, not even including the players that we've gotten rid of over this season. He tried to get rid of a lot of guys that we still have on loan and i actually think about it now he probably did a better job in terms of the actual outgoings you know considering kind of the restraints that daniel levy puts on things than actually we did this last summer this last summer we kind of seemed to struggle and kind of waited until the very last minute to sort of get rid of players and i think we ended up getting rid of guys we needed to but it felt like we could have been either more ruthless or just more proactive kind of about it and it felt like pratchett was definitely that type when he was at least here at full capacity. I then also look at the guys he even sort of signed kind of originally, like even the first sort of kind of signings he made, most of them, like apart from maybe some people really seem to cling on to the Galini one, a you're welcome to, and you know, you can have it, but his sort of ratio with like the players that he's been able to get as sort of hits are quite impressive. And his first season, Pop Matasar for under 20 million, Brian Hill, I think is maybe in the Galini bracket, maybe a bit more unproven, but a lot of people like us, Really do love him. Maybe the fee, I would say, is actually not too kind to him. But Bentoncourt for under $20 million. Emerson Royale, actually cheaper than Ryan Sessegnon, which I think puts a lot of context to that sort of transfer. Christian Romero is now going to be sort of the future of this back line. And was sort of the future of the back line when we originally got him. Now Richarlison, Yves Basuma, Destiny Udoji, Jed Spence, Pedro Porro. Ivan Perisic, Fraser Forster, and Clement Longley, I think in his following season, Sar. did build us out a lot as well. Yeah, Sar, I think I said, yeah, in the first season, right? You know, that was his first ever signing, I think, at the club, if I'm not mistaken. I think he's really shown that actually in two seasons, he had a pretty decent sort of hit ratio. And even in his second season, like the three sort of debatable kind of transfers that maybe people don't feel as comfortable about, Richarlison, Spence, uh, as well as Longley, I would say are all sort of kind of maybe to connected in some way to Daniel Levy. I don't want to sort of blame everything Definitely on Daniel Levy, but Richarlison, right, was connected to the whole Everton situation. Mm -hmm. Levy came out and said we were getting a deal or he was taking advantage of something. Spence certainly was, like you're about to say. Clement Longley, I think, was in some way connected to some Barcelona deal, and he didn't seem to want to really go big on a center back, I get that summer, so we decided to go cheap with Longley. You just have to sort of long. look at kind of the two seasons that he's done. He's basically torn down the Steve Hitchin Foundation, built an entire new one, got rid of a ton of, ton of players as well. I just feel like he's been able to revolutionize this whole club in a space of a very, very short time. He brought in players like, or brought in faces like Steinson, Holding, Gabonini, who kind of came in to modernize the club, sort of kind of changed the whole culture in and around the club as well. When you look at it, I think I kind of want to let somebody in off this because I know I'm ranting, but Guys like Gabonini, guys like Steinson, apparently they were kind of all regarded as well as Paratici, like kind of workaholics, really intense, 
kind of just sort of, you know, working all night type of guys. And some people, you know, kind of didn't like that. At least a lot of Ali Gold articles were kind of suggesting that a lot of the people that were already there at Spurs at the time didn't kind of like these sort of intense Italians sort of running around the place, like kind of identifying these players left and right and trying to revamp the whole kind of, kind of system. But clearly that was exactly what we needed, you know, kind of looking at it at hindsight. They actually did a lot in the space of two seasons, but I'm ranting and I want to let somebody in because I do think that's where I'm most impressed with Paratici. In the very little time, he's somehow shaped Tottenham to look entirely differently from complete ruins previously. I'd say as well, like probably reiterating the point I was saying before, everyone did think he was sort of like Conte's right-hand man, you know, worked together at Juventus. He was sort of brought in to try and maybe persuade Conte first time around, then the second time around, which is quite interesting. But it shows that he's it's, it's not like that because I'd say the majority of his signings weren't Conte players. They were for more, a more advanced coach, a.k.a. Ange. So I find that quite interesting. The only thing I'd say is it'd be sort of – uh, like thinking ahead and maybe more to the future, what will be the case of the relationship going forward? Obviously, in this 30-month ban, uh, he's only done a couple of months of it. Will he still be in this advisory role? Will he come back? Obviously, Tottenham's are still looking for a director of football. Obviously, Scott Munn is only new to his role as well. as t- Is it technical director? Uh, or something like that. I get confused yeah, yeah. with all these. I get confused with all these different roles and what they really properly do. When, especially when Levy is still like in charge of the day to day running. Um, so yeah, it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens going forward. Because I'd say a lot of, uh, I said I've said on a couple of podcasts already. Like we're going down this like stat based route. So maybe it's going to be a bit different in the sense of like what sort of contacts we make in world football. And you know, because we have sort of plucked a bit out of. The Bundesliga and South America, we sort of play, and even like some Premier League players. So we are working our way around. But it goes yeah. to show you, like a lot of people do criticize the Italian league um, for getting players out of there. And, you know, people will only say, like, is Salah the only good export from the Italian league? Um, yeah. But it goes to show you that, you know, that that double deal with Benton Kur and Kulisevsky was a blinder and I think if you were a Juve fan now you would want them 100% in that team because they are horrid and Romero you know as well we were able to extract oh, course, them yeah, there yeah. too and Dave like he forgot about this one but this is probably better that I set you up for it perhaps he also saved our youth academy yeah completely I mean in years gone by a lot of our players were leaving because there was no pathway to the first team for them and I don't blame them for instance if I was young Dennis Sarkin and I'm looking ahead of me and you know you've got Sessing or Ben Ben Davies and regardless of the performances they put in they continue to be picked I would be out of there as well um but look that, 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 that that's for a number of reasons right the reason why we were Failing to transition players is because the academy had one idea and the first team had another. So there was there wasn't that sort of telepathy between the between yeah. the both, and that was the main reason why they hired Ange Postecoglou is because of how he develops players, especially younger players, and he understands the importance of the link between the academy and the first team. But what Paratici came in and done, Jack, is he looked at the academy. He he was honest about. It. He said, "Look, this group of players ain't going to make it," and got rid of them. But then he said, right, we're keeping this group of players. And then the problem came about, well, how are we going to be able to keep, you know, get them to sign on? We have to show them a pathway. And that's where him and Greta Steinson actually was huge in this. He was constantly around, uh, you know, underage games, mingling with their parents and everything else. And they were huge in plotting out the pathway for these guys and end up tying them down to four or five-year contracts in some cases. Like, for instance, you look at Mikey Moore, Real Madrid, Dortmund, teams like that, very, very interesting. Yet, we were able to tie them down. So that shows that we've plotted them a pathway, which is absolutely huge. But then to bolster out the academy rather than waste, and that's that, that's what Ange Postacoglu, and I think this directive also sort of, you know, sort of Ange Postacoglu as well, because I read uh, one of his books, he says, you know, the younger a player is with potential, you're better off throwing them into the fire to sort of, uh, you know, see whether he sinks or swim. And those who, who sort of sink, you know, you don't waste any more of your time or your resources on them. So that's Paratici's method as well. So we've cleared them out. And in order to fill it out, we've gone and we've we've looked around at other clubs, other players, and we're able to recruit them and bring them in. And now look at the strength of our academy, our under-21s. They haven't lost a game yet like the senior team. They're cleaning up all around them, combined with the players that we kept. And now we've got a really good 
under 21 team we've got a solid solid under 18 team as well only have lost one game this season and they ain't going anywhere they're tied mm. down to Tottenham you had to come in you had to yeah. completely change the payment structure that was another reason why some of these younger players were leaving because the payment structure under the old McDermott regime which was continued on by Dean Rastrick it was sort of pay them as little as you can there's a wage structure in place keep them hungry Whereas when other clubs were coming in, they were like, well, hang on a minute, we can offer you 10 grand a week and first team football. So automatically they're out of there. Whereas now we can, we're can, we we're paying them sort of enough to be able to get them to sign on the dotted line. So he's been absolutely massive um, in that regards. And when you look at it, we've got Romero and Van de Ven sort of in and around the same age. And when they sort of come to an end, hopefully we'll have Dorrington and Phillips developed. And, you know, this guy Vuskovic and they're the next guys true. So it's not only a plan now for this current group of young first team that we have, but also the next wave coming true. So you've sort of, yeah. you should have a good 10 to 20 years, a bit like what Sir Alex Ferguson had at Man United because he had his team and then the class of 92 came true and it extended that again. So for me, it should set us up for a really long time, for the next 20 years at least, to maintain where we're at. And then those who we don't, don't make it because not everyone's going to make it. You sell and add up to your transfer budget, which is going to be absolutely key. Yeah. People go, how can Man City afford this? But they don't look at the money they're making off their academy products to fund the likes of a Gavardial and people like that, them sort of transfers. I think they made 200 million over the last um, couple yeah. of uh, seasons from their academy. So he's been absolutely instrumental in that. And that's a vital part as well as the first team to have all that infrastructure in place to continue continue on what you're doing. So fair play to him. He's done an absolute massive, massive job um, overall, Jack. And uh, Sonny, Dave also sort of brought this up to me earlier that nowadays you have to fork over so much money for homegrown talents of any kind. We paid $50 million for Brennan Johnson. If we do kind of go for this really talented sort of academy that we can kind of just pick whatever golden sort of gem from it, means we, in a way, kind of have to dip in less to the budget of uh, sort of buying a homegrown player like a Johnson to sort of just meet the quota. Because as good as Johnson is, I think we sort of did buy him to sort of meet some type of quota of some kind, you know, for the homegrown. We needed more homegrown talents in and around that first team, and we didn't have enough. Um, But now that we have this academy, now we don't have to fork over all that money all the time. And I think, you know, when Tottenham fans were saying the Spurs way, we want the Spurs way, it wasn't just on the field with the first team. It was our youth academy. You know, you look at the players who have come through. I'm thinking Harry Kane. I'm thinking Ryan Mason, you know, Andros Townsend. I know some of them aren't the biggest names, but, you know, when you have someone who has come from in and around the stadium, grown up watching the likes of Jermaine Defoe and whoever and they bleed lily white. That's what you want in your team. You know, you look at whether it's Manchester United or Liverpool, if you've got a homegrown talent in that team, it just gives you a bit more and they're, you know, they're living their dream out and they're like the personification of you as the fan as well because you are seeing them in you and you in them because it's just what it is. And, you know, thinking of it as a financial factor, we've seen like Chelsea this summer basically funded a lot of their transfer window by selling youth assets as well. But maybe we're not doing that because, you know, we I, I, I picked someone out in particular in uh, Sunset Bell, if I pronounce his surname yeah. spot yeah. on. We poached him from Chelsea. So we're showing that we can go to clubs that are probably bigger than us, but then maybe they don't see an avenue at Chelsea, especially Correct. with... I know they're looking at this younger model, but, you know, they're signing from other team's younger players so they're not really showing a perfect pathway for their youth side so that's what I think I see it as you know we've got so many players such as you know I'm thinking yeah. Noel John and you know even the players out alone Dane Scarlett Alfie Devine who have started quite well at Ipswich mm-hmm. and Port Vale you've got you know as you said there Ashley Phillips who we bought from Blackburn but mm-hmm. he's gone straight into the academy and you know Alfie Dorrington, who they've all got so much potential and they've got more of a chance now because the manager will bleed them in. You know, we saw Donnelly on the bench at the weekend. I know he didn't come on, but it's good to get 
their minutes. And I feel like the academy is being treated more seriously. You know, last year we saw Lucas Moura playing games with the under 21s. And I know maybe he was getting back to fitness, but to me, I find that a bit of a joke because it's sort of saying like, you know, treat this as its own entity, but then bleed them in as well. Like, and treat Mm -hmm. them with the respect of, they want to show that they're coming through Mm -hmm. and have one day the potential to be a starter. So I think good luck to them all. You know, I mean, we've already seen this yeah. season. I know some of them aren't homegrown, but like Saar's getting minutes. He's young. Uh, Destiny Odogi's yeah. getting minutes. He's young. You know, there's, there's a lot of chance for young players in this team. And, you know, it's a shame we're out of some cup, uh, the Carabao Cup because it would be nice to maybe see a bit of, you know, more rotation and some opportunities because obviously every game comes thick and fast mm-hmm. in the Premier League. So we might not see some of those players. But just to know that, yeah, I think I said it on the podcast the other week to show that, you know, Ashley Phillips is probably going to be the next centre-back to start if one of the other guys gets injured. It's a lot of faith and it shows that, you know, this academy is going to be our future. And it's just mm. good to see because I think, as I said, it's a Tottenham way. We love having, you know, one of our own, one ones mm. of our own. So, yeah, very happy with how they're doing. And it's just a, it's just a good vibe all around, isn't it, at the club? With the with the money that was spent on the academy, it's only right, you know, and the facilities and stuff. It's only right that we are producing these sort of players. But with with these guys at football, we have to understand they're always planning ahead and thinking ahead two, three, four years down the line as well. And when you look at the key core of Pochettino's squad, Carl Walker, we signed from Sheffield United's academy, had him around, developed them. Danny Rose from the Leeds Academy kept him around, developed him. Harry Kane brought him up from the academy, a few with, uh, with a couple of others. And they ended up forming the core group of that team, uh, you know, for that four or five years. And I think when you look at what's going on now, we, our golden generation sort of of the youth academy players, you've got Darrington Phillips, Donnelly, Sunsup Bell, um, Mikey Moore and some others all to come true. And they're all in around the same age, same group. Alfie Devine out alone as well. And, what we will end up doing then, I think, is the, when when you look at a lot of the homegrown core that are registered in the squad now, a lot of their contracts are actually up over the next year or two. Like Sir Ben Davy, Session, people like that, you know, Forrester, people like that, you probably expect not to get any renewals. So, therefore, we're going to be in a situation where we have to meet that homegrown quota. Well, we know Tottenham ain't going to go out and spend the tax or, you know, the money and the tax that are put on these players. So how are they going to do it? And for me, it's true developing these guys. That's why they've mm-hmm. um, tied down the ones that we think will make it. That's why they're out there in other academies poaching their best players to bring them through so that we can bring all of these guys through without having to spend a £100 million on a player just to bring them in for homegrown reasons. And everyone goes, well, where's, the, where, where, where's their opportunities? Well, when you listen to Hans Postacoglu, he talks about next season a lot. He doesn't really talk about achieving much this season. It's just about motoring on. But when, for me, it's all about next season for him. We get back into Europe. We're challenging on our front. You've got a bigger squad with a lot of the contracts up over the next two years. You have to fill out that squad. And not only are you going to do it by the transfer market, but you'll also have to fill it out by some of these young players. And that's where their opportunities will come. Um, so it's just about yeah. being patient, following the plan and seeing it true. And I think we've got the right guy to do it. He's, he's on a four-year contract. And for me, that's to work with the young players that we already signed under Paratici, but also bring these academy players through. And then we'll take it from there and see where this club goes. But we are building something very, very similar to what we had under Pochettino, which was academy-driven, youth-centric driven and led by a key group of homegrown players. And that's exactly what we're going to produce on their hands past the Coglu. So the times are good. You guys are waxing lyrical about the Academy and Dave sort of touched on it there for a second. He was touching on plenty of good things there, Sonny, but how do we sort of handle this rising and talented Academy while still sort of giving Ange the proper players to challenge, you know, in the competitions next season? I think it's just a fine balance. You know, you, you don't see... <laughs> what does that look it's like, like, a fine balance? You know, like maybe uh, if you were to give, like, yeah, w- what would it look like? Sorry. I feel like, you know, what was it? Uh, Alan Hansen said you can't win anything with kids. So I don't expect, <laughs> like, <laughs> 11 of the starters. But I think it's just a nice happy medium of, you know, we've already got a nice team, haven't we? We've got a nice start on 11. But the one worry you'd say for this season is depth. You know, you're quite, we're quite worried about, you know, a couple of injuries... And we haven't really got much to back it up. And 
I, f- I still feel like I don't care what people say. Someone could be smashing an academy up, breaking goal records, you know, keeping clean sheets. But when you chuck them into the deep end of a Premier League game, it's a whole new kettle of fish. Maybe it's time, you know, as well. If some of these players are hitting the ground running, get them some loans out in the in the um, in the January window. Get them some proper first team football. Maybe not Championship. Maybe not League One, League Two. You probably want to loan them to a team that plays a bit similar to like Ange Ball, like sort of a bit of attacking flair because that's sort of what they're going to do. Like I think sometimes when we loan to lower league England clubs and they're playing hoofball, it's sort of not the, it's a bit of a baptism of fire in a yeah. different way. So yeah. Yeah, I feel like, and as I, as I said, we're going to sort of go down this avenue of stat-based signings, bringing the squad down even younger. So I feel like the idea is we're going to complement, you know, the, the, we have to complement the team as we go along, you know, bringing in certain individuals and that that really help the squad in different areas, especially, as I said, with the injuries. And then also bleeding in youth prospects as and when are possible, you know, start out on the bench, see how they do in an FA Cup game and that sort of thing. But, yeah, I think it's a process, you know, as, as we're only, what was it, six, seven games into Ange Ball and Ange Postacoglu's reign in general. So it'd be interesting to see how he does it. And I could imagine him really being ballsy enough to put a Donnelly in a game maybe one week yeah. just to test it out or start an Ashley Phillips if there's an injury. Like I really back him to really put trust in these players, put his arm around them and say, you're part of this squad. You're not just a youth prospect. You're not there to be thrown away and forgotten about. But yeah. And if I do seem distracted, by the way, it's because Arsenal have just gone 2-1 down to Lens and it's in the corner of my eye and I'm like <laughs> secretly buzzing. So I'm trying to make all these points, but at the moment I'm like this. So sorry just, about that. <laughs> go first, Dave. And then I was going to touch on something too that he said. Yeah. yeah no, I'll let you go, Jack. I, I've spoke. So oh, I'll I, let you go. Sorry. I was going to maybe mention, Sonny, that I sort of agree and disagree on what you said about certain players from the academy being thrown into the deep end where I think you're absolutely right with plenty of them, but there are going to be some that actually probably you, you just have to feel like that they are sort of ready for that step up because if mm. you do end up giving them that loan away, they might end up being almost too good for whatever Belgian club or Netherlands club that you end up sort mm. of loaning them out to. And perhaps they but, might really need that season, but you sort of discover the Levi Colwells, you sort of discover the Inketias, you sort of discover kind of maybe the more mm. sort of straight into the first team sort of kind of academy mm. talents when you do kind of give them those chances, when those yeah, opportunities like Dave, uh, you know, spoke about, you know, maybe arose. And I think center back might be one of them. Like I think a certain Alfie Dorrington and an Ashley Phillips don't necessarily need really maybe a loan away. I think they probably will next season, just sort of in some capacity, kind of just be intermixed into the first team. They'll get some minutes here and there when needed. And I think what we will need is to sign a center back of some experience to actually kind of back up a Romero, to back up a Van de Ven but might as well just kind of have one of those guys challenge for that extra spot because they're supposed to be one of the most talented, if not the most talented in their age group, you know, for the yeah. England under 21 setup, for the England under 23 setup. And so you might think, is this the next Levi Colwell on our books? Is this the next Mark Guayhi on our books, you know, type of guy that even Guayhi, right, can, came straight from the Chelsea Academy to Crystal Palace playing first team football, you know, all of a sudden straight away. And I think that's what maybe some of these guys – could actually be good enough for Jamie Donnelly might be good enough for it. But then in his case, he's more in a saturated kind of area, kind of the midfield is very saturated. The forward areas, you know, are very competitive, but maybe if there's an opportunity for a left back to step in, right. I don't think there's much competition competition there. Like it's really just Udoji and then Ben Davies who kind of already needs to go. So if there's an, you know, like a, a Charlie Sayers who can come through the Academy there, there's a really good chance that you could take that spot. Um, So I think it's, a bit of both. I think you have to be talented enough. Like you said, you know, there really is a huge step up, but mm-hmm. also it's about, you know, there might just end up being those opportunities like where we kind of need a guy in that position. Do we want to look to the market or do we want to just give this kid a chance? And that's where I think it might come down mm-hmm. to. So I could see a Dorrington or a Phillips come through, whereas I don't know, maybe a Donnelly or an Alejo Valise, you know, despite them being super, super, super talented, might need that loan because I don't know, we're already so saturated in that area or I don't know. That's how I sort of see it. It's kind of opportunities and talent at the same time. Yeah. yeah look, I, I think, I think the best thing about it is that players are being picked on merit, right? Before they were being picked on the tried and tested. Now they're being picked on form performance and, and on merit. So 
you know, there's the incentive for these under 21s to not get carried away, not not having to look to go on the loan avenue, but stay around the club and look to develop and keep impressing. There's a number of ways we can do this. We don't have to just simply loan them out. I'd argue, especially in the lower leagues in, in England, because that's how we've lost a lot of academy players over the years. It's been a loan move for them, but there's been no succession plan. Um, whatsoever, and they've just got lost up in the system. For me, next year, you're going to be competing on all four fronts. Now, statistically, when you get European football, your injuries and your problems, the workload, everything else doubles. So that's where you really need your whole 25-man squad. Yes, we'll bring in another centre-back, but ideally you want five centre-backs. So you keep Phillips around, you keep Darrington around. Now, People said, but they need to play. Okay, well, they can play in the under-21s when they're not needed for the first team, and then when they're needed for the first team or they're being brought for cup games, go and give them their game time there and and just dip them in and out. That's what a lot of managers tend to do with young players. They dip them in and out. It's not like we're looking for these guys to come in and hit the ground running and play all 38 games. It's not. It's about just dipping them in and out. You can do the same way. Jamie Donnelly, in my opinion, another one. I don't see what benefit we're going to get from loaning him out with the level that he's at and what they're going to teach him. In fact, I think he'll probably regress with some of the stuff that other managers might teach him, you know, if you're playing a more defensive style, this, that, and the other. So for me, you keep him around, you do the exact same thing with him, and you fill out your squad. You are going to need a 25-man squad next year. The reason why we haven't been able to rotate in years gone by is because we haven't had that strength in depth. But by, by developing these youngsters, that's how we're going to create it with a couple more signings here and there. So just about being strategic and about being smart. Most academies, they look to produce that one player. Our mm. academy has about six, seven or eight of them, if not more, already just waiting for a chance, waiting for that opportunity. We've seen in the case of Papa Matasar, all you need is yeah. an opportunity. We loaned them out to the club we bought them from. He barely played. Come back to Tottenham, given an opportunity. Look at the way he's took it. It, with, yeah, it's true. with our academy now and most Premier League academies, the quality is there. It's not even an issue anymore whether it's a quality mm. in it. It's just about whether you provide a pathway. You look at Brighton, they do it expertly. You look at Brentford, they do it expertly. Well, now it's our turn to start doing it. And you do. For me, you look at most massive sort of holds on the Premier League. Man United started with the class of 92. Chelsea started with bringing in young players like Joe Cole, people like that. Man City started with the likes of Mika Richards, players through their academy, plus the money to be able to bring in other players. And this is the way Tottenham need to go. We can't just keep looking to spend, 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 spend. Sometimes you, the whole idea of the academy is you produce, which limits your spending. And I think, you know, we've mm. now had time where we've got these players we're with a lot of contracts coming up and a lot of the work we've already done to get a lot of shit out and a lot of the wages offloaded off the books. There's no better opportunity than now than ever before to bring them through. You look at Pochettino's rebuild. It's, it was youth eccentric. He brought through Bentaleb, Mason, people like that to add to the likes of Carl Walker, Rose and all that. So for me, I think it's the clear route to go down. Uh, and I'm really, really excited. There's different um, ways you can develop them. The old loan system doesn't always have to be like that anymore. You look at Brighton, they they, 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 they blow that loan system uh, sort of out the water. And they blew uh, Chelsea out of the water just the other night, Sonny. Uh, we weren't able to watch it because Spurs play. And also I think uh, they had the Premier League got in the way of us being able to watch it. They weren't able to, to show it. But the fact that this academy is even blowing away Chelsea – which was at one stage an academy that was producing player after player after player felt like, you know, I think even De Bruyne, right, was in the academy at one stage or, you know, there were guys that just, you know, routinely kept th- coming through there. You look at Man City just recently, like Dave, uh, you know, brought up everybody's buying a Man City, you know, academy player these days. It's all just uh, it's something that Spurs have had needed to catch up with. And it feels like quite quickly, you know, to kind of circle things back to practice in a way. It kind of did sort of uh, catch up uh, quite quickly. but And I'm excited to have a, an, a talented academy. I'm excited to have a very young and talented first team. Spurs are young. Spurs are fresh all of a sudden. And just last thing I'll add just quickly before we move on, Jacko, uh-huh. is you look at a lot of the academy players. They're all on the young side of 21, 18, 18 years of age. So it's not like other players before where it's like Harvey White, for instance, coming out of the academy, 21, 22 years of age. And now you're they going, oh, we have years. to loan them out. 
Yeah, exactly. Now we actually have time to be able to dip them in and out of the first team and keep them in under 21 football, which will aid, in my opinion, aid us and aid their process. Mm-hmm. We have um, an opportunity, Sonny, this weekend to make some rotations and changes, maybe a chance to see some new players. Um, kind of last question here before we wrap things up. Would you like to see any new faces come into the team against Luton uh... Town? I, I mean, I know everyone's going to act like it's Luton Town. We should beat them, but bloody, you never know with us, do you? We could really face a low block. But And also, we've got to be very wary of set pieces. I watched um, Jamie yeah. Carragher did a piece on Monday Night Football about how they're very clever from set pieces. And, uh, I, and we're I, not I, good at defending them. Yes, <laughs> very much under and with, I mean, even under Conte, to be fair, we were good at scoring them. We weren't good at uh, and Joe, defending yeah. them. And Joe, yeah. Bloody hell. But I, I, I'd, li- I'd like to see pretty much a similar team, I'd think, because it's good to get this team keep going. It's only before an international break as well. So you'd mm. like to see maybe – it's the forward line for me that always week in, week out, I seem to question. I Not question, but like – think about rotating or maybe trying something different. I think some through the middle would be quite interesting again. It's just the wingers. Does Richardson maybe – get another game maybe as the assist sort of yeah. helped him out probably could he get a goal maybe I mean I'd like to see maybe Solomon I feel like he was a bit unlucky to be dropped recently so yeah I feel there's a lot more questions to be asked really with um like selection process like maybe does an Ollie skip get a game I'm not sure I, I'd like pretty much the same team to play again I like the uh I was going to say lack of rotation at the moment because yeah. I think it is good to clarify who your starting lineup is at the moment. As I say, we're on the cusp of an international break. You know, this team has proven itself in some big tests already this season. So I'm pretty much happy. But if Ange thinks maybe another player is a bit different, he might tweak it a little bit for a tactical edge. Um, I think that would be quite interesting. But yeah, it's. I mean, I, I, I keep bringing it up, but the, I don't know if you guys have seen the Man United game. It is kicking off and i clearly will say and uh just on a separate point here vicario is so clear of onana it is actually sickening and i'm actually going to do a video that's going out when this goes live while i was wrong about vicario because uh, <laughs> oh. we had a little chat the other way didn't we that's Jack, like about a fourth that? Yeah, you're being too been. honest though sonny you've done now like three you've done i've done a video with it where you've you know said that you know i think you've already alluded to it you're being so nice you know to oh. admitting you're wrong not many people <laughs> admit they're wrong that many times you know <laughs> so anything for the nice. views baby <laughs> <laughs> uh big vic is definitely this i think probably one of the steals in the summer for sure yeah. um Going on to Luton, though, my sort of quick thoughts on it. I think Brian Hill, be lovely to see him kind of go into the team. Mm -hmm. I think, Richie, maybe you play through the middle. I feel like him playing well on the wing might be just sort of unique to that Liverpool game and to that opponent in particular. I think he had a decent game, but just feel like maybe Luton Town, with the way they'll set up, there won't be really a lot of space for him or anything like that. And he's just sometimes a little bit clumsy out on that wing if there's not really a lot of space for him. So I'd rather maybe more of a technician kind of be put mm. out there like a Brian Hill, maybe like a Solomon or someone else like a Glusevsky could even be put on the mm. left. You know, you never know. I think maybe rotation with Gio Lo Celso would be nice, but he's constantly injured and he might still be on the medical table, his favorite place to be. Uh, mm. Emerson, maybe you could throw in at right back, but I sort of agree. I think you kind of just have to go into a full force, keep the winning vibe. Basuma, by the way, needs to get a yellow card. So Basuma, think about your naughtiest yeah. tackles at any stage that you see an attack, you know, maybe going Luton's way. Remember that you got to get that yellow for us, but that's all I can say for it. Dave? Um, yeah, I just, I disagree with Sonny slightly on what you said at the start where, you know... <laughs> You know, we shouldn't take this for granted. I mean, when the fixtures come out, I look at them two games and I'm like six points. I know the managers do and I know the players do. So for me, we should go into this full of full of confidence. This old cliche, there's no easy game in the Premier League. I mean, yeah, there isn't, there isn't. I mean, I, I, I don't buy it. Luton, you should be walking out there smashing. You look at them fixtures, six points. Thank you very much. Look, they are going to be difficult. They're going to sit back, look to play us on the counter. That's where we, you know, we have to let our quality shine true. Now, I'm a bit torn on whether we make changes or not. Now, the old rule is, and the old saying is, you never change a winning team, which I, I subscribe to. Um, you keep the nucleus of that team as much as you can. And also, with the situation we're in this year, we actually don't have to rotate, you know. We can just roll the same team out most weeks, barring an injury or a suspension. But 
this is where I'm a bit torn because with Madison and Son taking off in the North London Derby, taking off against Liverpool, two of your biggest games this season, they're clearly struggling. They're clearly carrying knocks yeah, and they're going through something. the pain barrier for Tottenham. Now, they will be called up and they will go on international duty. So do we take the foresight to manage the workload and give them a bit of time to rest and, and maybe pull them out of the team for that game, knowing that they will be playing on international duty? Or do you just ignore that and say, well, fuck that, I ain't resting them for the benefit of the international teams. We pay his wages. We're going to put them out there this week. So I'm a bit torn on that. I'm also torn. Do you go with Richie through the middle? Because whether we like it or not, as good as Sonny is, has been up front, Against Liverpool, we didn't have that presence in the box. And when we did put the presence in the box, we forced Matip into a mistake when we had Valise and Richarlison in there. Um, against Sheffield United, we didn't have that presence again until Richarlison came on. And, you know, these are teams with the, with the way Liverpool end up going down to my men. Low block teams and low block systems. We're getting the ball out wide, but we don't have the presence in the box. So, for me, do you then move Richarlison in the middle? I'm, I'm I'm torn on that. Well, look, come come and come and view me on the pre-match build-up. You'll find all my thoughts on all of that uh, going forward because I'm still home and hand on what to do against them. But one thing I would like to see, the likes of Gil Messi off the bench. I'd love to see Donnelly rewarded with five ten minutes if things are going the right way. Uh, same as an Alfie Dorrington or an Ashley Phillips, you know, or a Valise. If, yeah. if 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 we've got the right scoreline with 10, 20 minutes to go. I'd absolutely love yeah, to see some it. of these guys get minutes. No, they deserve it. Absolutely. Everybody, I think we might call it on this podcast, and it's going to be many more. more. Yes. Yeah. Are you doing any predictions score-wise? Because at the moment, I'm two out of two, haven't I, for some of our score oh. predictions? Oh. Well, I'll put my neck on the line again. Did you go 2-1 well, for Liverpool? Are... Well, I did go 2-1 for That's Liverpool. Wow, impressive. This guy's good, Dave. Well, we are going to start mixing this podcast up and do some more fun segments and everything now that we've got you involved with us every week. So we will definitely have to do a score prediction segment. We'll get that uh, together. Might, might might do some Premier League scores. How about that? Compete. Maybe we got we got to tally them though. We got to figure out. You know, if Sonny's really once the pressure's on. Now we, that we start keeping score, will he? No, the loser, <laughs> the, loser yeah. the loser at the end of every single month or something like that. I'll have to do a forfeit, and we'll let the followers mm. pick the forfeit to do. I should have kept quiet. We, 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 we'll do a score prediction for the Spurs game just to keep this bit of uh, rivalry going. So, you know what, Jack? We'll let you go first, and then we'll go to Sonny, and then I'll give my last. 3-0. Uh, it could be 1-0 going into the second half, and then we grab two more in the second half. 3-0. Mm, okay. Okay. Not too confident, Jack. Oh, Sonny? It could be tricky there. It could be tricky. It's, it's, it's going to sound like a copy because I was thinking 3-0 as well. But I just think... I, I, I think this could be like the Burnley game. Like I don't know if you guys have seen Burnley have beaten Luton tonight and Luton were at home. This was the game that has um, meant to be played at the beginning of the season, but then because they didn't fix Kenilworth Road up in time, it got played tonight. So, And Burnley haven't been amazing either, so it is probably the, the battle of mid that. Uh, so, I th yeah, I think 3-0, but I can't see us really turning the screw like Burnley. I feel like we'll, you know, it'll be like a nice, comfortable 3-0. I can imagine us playing some nice stuff. Start cruising. They might, yeah, they might frustrate us a little bit. I can imagine us uh, imagining they will frustrate us a bit more and it'll be like a bit of a weird test. But you just have to think, and I'm not jinxing it here, we have got so much better firepower <laughs> for someone like Sun to score loads of goals past Tom Lockyer, who is so bog standard. I know he's got a weekend, so but he is so non-league it's unreal well do you know what i'm gonna go big this weekend because i'm feeling it i think <laughs> when, when, when i look at loot and i think the manager's playing with a lot of different ideas a lot of different solutions to try and compete in the premier league i think their back line will let them down to do concede goals um i've got six one in my head so i'm gonna go what? six one I'm going to go 6 1 Tottenham. I think they'll be going this weekend for us. I really do believe it. I think you look at it, you've got Kulazeski bound. He, he, he's bound to bag a few. You know, he's waiting to bag a few. Richarlison is waiting to bag a couple of goals. Will there be some here for them? You know, Son, if, if, if they give him any space, it's in the back of net. Same with Madison. So, I mean, you know, when I look at that, when I look at the quality and some of the players on the periphery who only deserve goals at this moment in time, I think this could be the weekend where it happens. Um, look, yeah. it's not. 
Luton aren't any great shakes. Let's be brutally honest. Yes, they beat Everton, but apart from that, they haven't offered much. Apart from that horrible orange jersey that they're wearing. Dave, by the way, everybody, just an FYI, he really had a tough time trying to figure out how to edit the Luton Town crest into our watch along thumbnail. So I have a feeling maybe he was, you know, just taking it out right there by going for a six one scoreline and all this sort of hatred, you know, towards Luton Town right now is just maybe coming out with that uh, thumbnail frustration. But who Jack, knows? I it could be genuine. Really just like they hate us. It's mutual. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody, please thank Sonny in the comments down below. Looking forward to plenty more podcasts after this one. It will probably be switched up at some stage. You know, we want to add some new segments. We want to, you know, kind of uh, do plenty of good things with this. And so feel free in the comments down below to let us know what you want to see from it. You know, something that maybe you've been thinking about for some time that this podcast has been needing. Like I said, you know, this is a 38th version of it. We're trudging along, but there's still plenty more episodes to go. We're still quite young in this, you know, sort of road with it. So everybody still plenty of ways to sort of get involved and to change it for the future, but hit the like button on the way out, check out Sonny's channel, please for us. And we will be seeing you come on you Spurs in the big end. We trust. We, we never stop. stop. See you, everybody. <laughs>